this month. Triumph, tragedy, a brutal leg, and broken crew. We go behind the scenes in Brazil with the new Volvo Ocean Race leaders, plus an Asian offshore classic, and going extreme in Omar. Behind the dockside smiles and away from the Auckland buzz, anxiety was building among the Volvo Ocean Race crews. The mood was changing. The fleet was now halfway around the world, and the race had intensified. The favourites were no longer dominant, as Mapfre's points lead withered. Tension was building. With more than half the available points on the table and double points for the next leg from New Zealand to Brazil, plus a bonus point for the first boat to round Cape Horn, the race for overall victory was back on. So now it comes down to the people and the mindset and who's put under pressure and who's not and who's got pressure more importantly and who hasn't. But the pressure in Auckland was about more than just points. The next 7,000 miles would be the toughest of the race and everyone knew it. Really it's the leg that the Volvo Ocean Race has been defined by. It's also no secret that we're actually getting quite late in the season for rounding the horn. Potentially the weather's getting worse, certainly the low pressures are getting a bit more frequent and a bit more potent so uh, Certainly in this race, when we're uh, rounding the horn as late as we are, it would be, it'd be really nice to get round. It's a massive landmark leg. Not everyone makes it. And I think historically we know that boats have perished, sailors have perished, and you know the lucky ones get round. And so far my luck's been going quite well, and I just hope it holds out. Since the first race back in 1973, the Southern Ocean has been the focus of attention for sailors and followers alike. The ocean wasteland at the bottom of the world has always had a fearsome reputation. And in 45 years, nothing has changed. Big waves, serious breeze, and cold are the norm. The start was a familiar affair, as the fleet completed the inshore course before heading out into open water. The big leg was underway and the reality of the task ahead was starting to sink in. I don't think you can ever really be ready for um, six days or whatever it's going to be driving in a row, so we're all going to be pretty broken by the time we get there, but that'll be good fun. Five days in, and the fleet began to zigzag its way along the boundary set by the race organisers to keep the fleet north of any ice. The pace was blistering, the manoeuvres relentless, and the weather brutal. Striking the right balance between speed and safety was stressful. The problem is not uh, average wind, it's the uh, clouds, a strong wind, the gust. And uh, when you have uh, 40 knots, we know what sail to use. And then you have a gust to 55 and you have uh, too much sail and that's, you have to react. But the weather had more in store. As expected, um, wind's building now into 35 to 40 knots. It's pretty solid, basically, um, right on the limit, survival conditions. Reports of huge seas, big winds, major squalls, damaged sails and fatigued crew became commonplace. Among them, the series leader. Well, we just had a problem on board, uh, just preparing the jibe when we were reefing, uh, going for the second reef, or, uh, before the jibe, as we've been doing, just to be as safe as possible. The mass track came undone and grew. Pretty much what happened to Axel during a dive in, uh, in leg three. Then, tragedy. So I'm very saddened to let you know that um, we have probably lost one of our crew members in the Volvo Ocean Race, John Fisher. On day nine, 1,300 miles west of Cape Horn, Sun Hong Kai Scallywag reported a man mm. overboard. Sailing in 35 to 40 knots of wind and in six metre seas, the boat had crashed jibed after surfing down the face of a wave. As the boat spun around and laid flat, crew member John Fisher was knocked overboard. He was wearing full survival gear, yet despite retracing their track and conducting an extensive search, the Scallywag team were unable to find their crew member. The loss was devastating. 
and sent shockwaves throughout the fleet. The nation this week claimed, claimed a good man in fish and, um, you know, from myself and, I'm, and I know everyone right here who are very deeply affected by it <coughs> and offer our, um, our thoughts to the family. It's absolutely devastating for everyone on board and, and obviously morale's down and we can't imagine the pain that they're all going through and so um, now our thoughts are really first and foremost with those guys and um, you know the race is really secondary at this point. Emotions were raw. Messages of support from home carried an even greater poignancy. For some, it was hard to hold back. Nearly at the turning point of this race. I'm really looking forward to getting to. I think everyone is. It's cold and horrible. And, uh, it'll be really nice to get there and can't wait to see everyone in uh, Brazil. But the weather wasn't giving up as the fleet ran headlong towards the most notorious and feared headland of them all, Cape Horn. The pressure was going to build even further as this brutal leg played out. Stay with us to find out how. The 2018 Extreme Sailing Series kicked off in style. Muscat in Oman had delivered. Big breeze and close competition. But finishing third had been a wake-up call for the local team. As a team, we're probably a little bit disappointed, to be honest. We know we can be a lot better. 2018, it's going to be a brutal season, I'd say. You're going to have some highs and some real lows because the teams are up another notch. While they may have been disappointed not to win, Robertson's team had at least made it onto the podium. But for one of their crew, the opening event struck a chord close to home. My name is Nasser Salman Mashari. I'm from Oman. I live in Muscat, I born in Muscat. I've got a family here in Muscat, uh, eight brother, three sister, and uh, we are very close to each other. I get very, very big support from them, and uh, I'm happy for that. I'm traveling a lot with the Oman Air and Oman Sail as well, so uh, I miss home a lot. People here and the uh, culture, I love the culture. When people ask me, NASA, I mean, what you do when I tell them sailing, they was so shocked about sailing this and what, what's exactly by now. I mean, people, uh, they're not surprised because uh, sailing coming more popular in Oman. And people now, they like to sail a lot and uh, the young generation, which they, they're pushing hard, and uh, I'm so uh, happy and proud to be support them, and uh, I'm sure we'll have uh, a great future for sailing. For many schools, it's now part of the curriculum. They will host the inter-school championship, and uh, this morning as well, uh, I mean, Pizza and I, we was in, in water with them and coached them, and uh, we're so, so, so happy. I mean, we saw the cat, I mean, kind of these kids, uh, I mean, uh, they're challenging and fighting on the race course. It makes me so proud and so happy. And uh, they will be in next in future. Meanwhile, next stop for the Oman Air team will be Lake Garda in May. There's going to be five teams battling it out at every sort of stop for those three podium steps. And if you're not on them at every event, you'll probably be out of the title race at the end. So uh, it's going to be a very tough year, and we're excited for it. Coming up next, carnage at Cape Horn, plus how to rebuild a crew. Welcome back. Still to come, Asia's offshore classic, and behind the scenes with the new Volvo Ocean Race leaders. But first, as the fleet barreled towards Cape Horn, Breakdowns and broken dreams lay in store. Stress, wild weather and tragedy had characterized leg seven of the Volvo Ocean Race from Auckland to Itajaé, Brazil. Having snatched an early lead in the leg, Brunel were first around the infamous landmark, Cape Horn. 
uh, this week was uh, was really hard. I think one of the hardest I've ever done, and I've been there uh, eight times before. See the horn, and uh, you can just see it on the faces of the crew. Finally, uh, they're coming from smiles appearing on the faces again. There were no smiles aboard Mapfrey. Having nursed their rig through the Southern Ocean, the damaged mast track eventually gave way, ripping the mainsail and causing even more damage to the mast. A pit stop was essential. Others were also facing problems. They had a frontal system, turned us into the waves, and they're massive. And clearly we've dropped off one and the rig's not going up. And now Liz has got the unenviable task of going up there to find out what the problem is. Okay, so I'm part of the problem. Spreader two, starboard side. The spreader root looks like it's threaded. I found the problem. Kafari's crew had been lucky. They'd saved their mast and had managed to fix the problem. But on the same day, Vestas 11th hour racing had been less fortunate. Shortly after celebrating their rounding of the horn, disaster struck. We were uh, routing at about 75 true wind angle in about 30 knots of breeze and uh, there was a big bang and uh, the rig broke just above the first spreader. A crushing blow to a team that had been forced out of yet another leg of the race. Motoring the 100 nautical miles to the Falkland Islands gave the crew time to reflect. I think that just, it just tells the story. This race is about overcoming the difficulties. We can't really overcome this one now, but we can we can make a for, plan to go forward and, and uh, try our hardest to keep, keep in the race. Axo Noble was also fighting to stay in the hunt after discovering a potentially serious leak in the keel area. All right, I'm going to go down here. Just went down, check the keel. Uh, there's two um, cover plates for the keel box, the wet box. The front half of our port ones has snapped off completely. So there's a gaping hole about that big in the, in the bottom of our boat. Meanwhile, the race at the front of the fleet had intensified. Brunel's lead was under threat from Dongfeng as the pair headed north towards the finish at Itajaye. Of course we want to win. Not only me, everybody likes to win it. We are fighting for the first place with Brunel, but we don't have to forget that the boat is tired, the people are tired, and the biggest mistake we could do would be to push too much to try to win this leg. As the breeze dropped, the battle between the pair became a needle match placing even greater stress on the already exhausted crew. But Becking's team held its nerve. After more than two weeks of leading the fleet and covering almost 7,800 miles, they had sealed victory, albeit by less than 15 minutes. There's been a, a really tough leg, I think, especially emotional, uh, of course, with, uh, with the loss of John. Uh, that sits uh, really, really deep, and I think especially as being a skipper, you're just feeling all that responsibility for your crew members and the family members at home. But we won, and it, uh, now all of a sudden the scoreboard looks uh, a little bit more in our favour. Cordelier's Dong Feng team had been looking for a win. Yet, with Matt Frey finishing fifth, second place put Dong Feng at the top of the overall rankings. Leg seven had been brutal and the scoreboard reordered. Yet as they set foot ashore, every crew member aboard every team was acutely aware of the price that one sailor had paid. Six months after the start of the race, with 11,000 miles to go, crews have been pushed to their limits and beyond. Having burned more calories than they could possibly consume, many were running on empty. Now leading the race, Dong Feng needed to ensure that their team was fit enough for the big push north, but how? Stay with us to find out. Hong Kong's unmistakable skyline provided the backdrop. It's Royal Yacht Club, the venue. And the China Sea, the racetrack, for the 29th edition of this 565 nautical mile offshore race to Subic Bay in the Philippines. 
Among the favourites in the 29-boat fleet was 2016 Line Honours winner Alive from Australia and race veteran Carl Kwok sailing his Mod 70 trimaran Beaugest. The pair had history. Kwok had set the course record in 2000 aboard his Whitbread 60, but lost it to Philip Turner's Alive in the last race when the Australian yacht set a new record of 47 hours, 31 minutes and 8 seconds. The pair locked horns from the start. Light winds meant that there was little difference in speed in the opening stages of the race. But once out in open water, the breeze picked up and the tri stretched her legs, averaging 20 knots for the first 23 hours. But the conditions didn't last as the breeze dropped 100 miles from the finish. Nevertheless, Quok's try had put plenty in the bank early on and took line honours with ease. We're thinking about finishing the race within a day and 10 hours. So now it's come to a day and 15 hours, I think. At the end of the day, we, we came and did what we wanted to do, have a new record. In fact, they'd smashed it, taking more than nine and a half hours off the previous record time. Meanwhile, Alive had looked like they could better their own record, but the light winds near Luzon slowed their final progress. Yet the crew remained upbeat. We went through all our transitions, we did all of that, and all the, the crew work was perfect, it was stunning. It was actually one of my favourite races, <laughs> that, you know, for, for the entire length. Freeze-dried food for weeks on end. It's a love-hate relationship. Pasta Provencal for the lunch and chili con can for dinner. Uh, after one week or ten days, you will eat the same thing again. Every day. You will hate it. And also, the taste uh, especially for me is uh, terrible. You must remember not to put the water in too early on the Pasta Provencal because it gets a bit cloudy. I think a 30 minute preparation time will be sufficient for that one. Chili con carne though likes a little bit longer, maybe an hour, otherwise the beans get a bit dusty. I don't like dusty beans. I never want to see this one again. I would actually say some of these meals I would order if I was out at a restaurant. They're that good. Love it or hate it, all develop cravings. Beer and a steak generally is the first thing on the mind. You can't beat a, a bunch of fresh fruit and um, you know, and then moving into the uh, steak. And Brazil's a great place for getting a good steak on that first night. In addition to cravings, Leg 7 had left crews running on empty. The Volvo Ocean Race, mentally and physically, um, is uh, it tears your body apart. During the race, you will never gain any muscle or any strength or any endurance. Arriving here was the most broken I've been. I yeah, was 17 days of just pure abuse. This is where you start seeing teams getting tired. The three most important months of the race are ahead of us. This point of the race is where the survival of the fittest starts. None of this was a surprise to the new race leaders. What I say to the team from Auckland onwards, it would be the land of opportunity or the beginning of the nightmare. And the Dongfeng race team had planned for this in great detail. We highlighted this leg as the absolute focus, arriving from Auckland into Itajai on a successful positive note. And we knew that if we could be on the upslope at this point, we would be on a very positive path to the end of this race. Now with a one-point lead, 11,000 miles of racing ahead and one-third of the points still on the table, Getting back in shape was crucial. We take a lot of physiological measurements. We do, we do obviously body weight. Um, we do hydration levels when they arrive. We look at um, limb circumferences, and then we look at the, the skin fold measurements. And with that, you get a very good understanding of how the body's actually changed. But what we're seeing is actually, compared to the last race, we're seeing some really good stability in our numbers. So we obviously have baseline figures, and we have acceptable margins that we know that we can play with, and we know we can bring the guys back from. And uh, the underlying principle, the goal from this, the beginning of this campaign, 
approach was to really try and minimise this accepted deterioration. This idea that these guys have to arrive at the finish line physiologically broken and we wanted to challenge that from the start. The crew's recovery programme started as the lines went ashore. So typically we have two or three days of a little bit of gentle sort of a landing protocol whereby we do a lot of injury assessment, we do all the measurements, we listen to the guys, we do some menu planning for the next leg and uh, we give them a little bit of time and space. One of the aspects that's been really good for us is actually having a chef that's worked with us from the very beginning of this project and is accompanying us all the way around this tour. What I like to do when they just arrive is try to find nice pastry or this kind of stuff. It's really when they arrive on the dock that I'm going to be the first to give them something nice to eat. But the chef's duties extend beyond just the sailors. We have all the support team. We have the technical part, the performance, the logistics, the communication, everyone. Like, it's like a little company. My day when they do the refit is a 5.30 start, 6.30 breakfast. They still think I'm doing magic. <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not doing magic. Sometimes, yes. But just with the chopping cake. Meanwhile, in the team container, a different kind of food preparation. We're putting all the individual food programs together this week. The sailors come in and we work through the individual packing per day. So we have all 18 days for the next uh, leg, everything laid out and we run it through the spreadsheet to know exactly what they're consuming. You know the trick for this one is to put it in your freeze dried. Yeah, okay. With a week to go and the crew on the mend, the gym sessions start. Working through, two to go, yeah, go on. Yeah, finish strong. There's no point in going hard in the gym two days after you've arrived from a 20-day leg. When we arrive, our blood is taken, and from our blood tests, they can see how much recovery we need. We start very slowly, generally a week after you've come back on shore, then we get into some weight work, some strength work in, in the gym. It's not to try and build something, but it's just to try and maintain what you've built previously. As soon as you get a mismatch between nutrition and the tasks on board, you're burning fuses, you're burning matches, and they'll, they'll, they'll soon be out of energy, and that's what we really want to try and avoid. And you may feel like we're almost there, one long leg to go, and then the transat and a couple of shorter legs, but there's still one third of the points to go and we're still very conscious of that fact that there's only one point between us and that for it and everything is to play for and we have to keep, keep striving and trying to thrive in this environment. Next month, riding with the big guns. The World Sailing Show heads to St Bart's.